Hey everybody, Darren Burroughs here. Today I'm here with Mel and Dave Dupuy uh, from North Bay, Ontario, and we're going to be talking about using OPM and owning properties outright and buying real estate. Now, these guys are the foremost experts in this category. Uh, they're killing it in real estate investing right now. I'm so excited that they're here to join me today. Before we get into it with Mel and Dave, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for us. Without further ado, let's get into it. Mel, Dave, great to have you guys here. Before we jump in, give us a bit of an intro on who you guys are and what you do as real estate investors. Yes, well, thank you so much, Darren, for having us. Um, basically, Dave and I, we are full-time real estate investors. Uh, we've been doing it now combined for 19 years. We keep saying 19, but it's, it's been 19 for a while. I know. So it's probably, <laughs> yeah, no, you kind of get stuck in <laughs> sure it's 21 now. Yeah, right? we have to recalculate. Uh, but yeah, so, and we, uh, we solely own over 170 units, and we specialize in buying multifamily properties using none of our own money and without joint venture partners. Explain that a little bit. So, uh, because there's lots of different ways to buy properties and acquire real estate, you guys have come up with this model that is essentially you're buying properties, multifamily properties for the most part, using other people's money, uh, but you still own it 100% outright. Explain how that works. Uh, yeah, we're borrowing that money. We have private lenders, private investors, uh, creative financing, you know, owner financing, vendor take back, seller finance. Everyone calls it a different thing, right? Uh, but yeah, using other people's money uh, in order to purchase real estate and, and instead of, uh, of giving equity or, or partnerships, just because that, that wouldn't work for Mel and I, and I know it works for some people and kudos, uh, and that's amazing. And there's so many ways to buy it, but our structure, we want to give everything to our kids right down the road. So we need to solely own it, but yeah, so we utilize other people's money. We give them interest obviously, and uh, they entrust us with our deals because we we make sure to only buy good ones that are going to cash flow and be able to, to pay them back. Uh, and that's kind of how we do it in, in a very quick nutshell. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you guys mind if we break down a deal? Because Dave, you mentioned so many different things like OPM and using other investors and all that kind of stuff. Can we walk through a, a deal or two and just explain how you, how you're able to do that? Yeah, absolutely. We can do one that we've done in the past if you want, Darren, and we can do an active one that uh, is in transition. So, I'd love to do them both. Yeah. Perfect. So t tell us about the first one. Um, how did you acquire it? You know, first of all, where did you find it? Um, and, and then kind of run us through the process. Yeah, great. And this was a, uh, an off market deal. Uh, it had been listed I think a year before. So, and, and, uh, the realtor was oh, sorry off market. The realtor had a pocket deal, you know, a pocket listing where they didn't want to list it. And they thought if you know someone, it was a sixplex, and we purchased it. It was in our city. Uh, we purchased it for five seventy five. Uh, and I don't want people to get caught up in the numbers because this works everywhere. You know, some people might say that's a steal of a deal where I live. Some people might say, oh my gosh, I can't believe you paid that much. So, yeah, no, focus on the concept of it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I bought a property for a million dollars in Toronto and tore it to the ground. So, you know, everything's relative. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 575, sixplex. And this was a, it was my, sorry, it was a widowed lady. Her husband had built the building. He was the real estate investor. She saw it as a burden and, uh, and a problem. Um, so yeah, pocket deal, we come along, hey, we have a credit union that is going to give us 75% uh, first mortgage. Uh, if you can, and this was one of the 12 and 12, if you can hold the second mortgage. Yep. So she held the second mortgage and this was a true win-win for her. Um, she was able to get rid of the property and then we were able to increase its value. So what we refer to often is forced appreciation. It truly was an underperforming property. Uh, the rents were really, really yeah. low. There was one uh, unit that needed to be redone as well. But other than that, the other units were in excellent condition. So we knew we didn't have to put too much money into it, but there was a huge um, appreciation that could happen. So, you know, short story, TLC got that one unit that was down to the studs, uh, renovated, rented, up the other rents. I think about, that was 2017, and we just refinanced it uh, during COVID with CMHC this year. So whatever, whatever, however many months that adds up to. Mm -hmm. um, but we got the evaluation up to 840. Don't quote me on that, 840. So obviously got a new first mortgage, paid her out, paid the existing mortgage. We're left with a cash flowing asset, cash flow every month. Um, and we put no money into the deal technically, right? Everyone else's mm -hmm. money. Yeah. And now we, we keep cash flowing. So an infinite return deal, right? Can I ask a couple of clarifying questions on the, on the, the vendor take back is essentially what you did there or the seller financing, whatever. 
Um, you, you brushed over it quickly because you guys do this all the time. So do I, but for those people that have never done one, so you got the bank to come in and finance the first 75%. Then you went to the seller and said, Hey, we would like to, you to hold a second mortgage on top of the first mortgage, that additional 25% to essentially bring up your loan to value to hundred percent. What was the term of that loan and, and what did that loan look like? So interest rate, you know, you, you mentioned about 27, 20, maybe, you know, maybe 36 months. Was that the initial term? Is there, was there an extension to that? How did that no, So we did go with a five year term. Okay. Um, and the reason we went five years is because we always want to worst case scenario. So we figure mm -hmm. that it would come to fruition um, very early on, but we're all about making sure, of course, to have our exit strategy. We always talk about exit strategy and what that means essentially is making sure that we can repay them back on time. Mm -hmm. um, but ideally, of course, as we always do, is pay them back early, unless they don't want to be paid back early. That happens mm -hmm. as well, but typically we pay them back early. So no, in this case, we had five years, uh, but because we were able to, to force the appreciation, it came to fruition early, then we refinanced paid her out um, and made it a win-win. Now in this case, she, she took the money and kind of did her thing quite often. What happens though, and this is where you as an investor, you're able to continue to grow from it. You pay them back and now they know you, they like you, they trust you, you pay them on time, you pay them back early, you never miss the payment, you communicated with them and now they want to do it all over again, whether they have another property to sell or not, or perhaps now they can become a private lender, whether mm -hmm. in the form of, you know, maybe they have RSPs or a line of credit through a promissory note. So there's just so many options. And was the seller familiar with this strategy or did you guys have to explain it to them a little bit? No, she was not. Um, this was her husband's mm -hmm. um, really passion, um, the real estate. So she, she, she just, she, she was stuck. She was, she was in a situation where she's like, I want to get rid of this building and whatnot. So we, it truly was a win-win a situation, but no, absolutely breaking it down, explaining to her why she should consider this, explaining to her and showing her most importantly, our exit strategy. Um, we always use our matrix for that. So, so that was really, really important part of it all. So break it down for me, if you don't mind, what did the conversation sound like? Because I know a lot of people are going to be interested in doing this kind of thing. And the thing that I hear a lot is you can't do it on smaller transactions on, you know, single family dwellings, but it's absolutely available on every single transaction as long as it's uh, the right seller. Right. And I think that's really key. So what was the conversation? How did you explain what are the benefits of somebody holding a second mortgage on a property that they, that they essentially want to sell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and again, this was succession planning for, for this lady, right? So because she did not have it. Uh, so we were actually, we saved her from this property if you want to put it for lack of better terms or lack of better wording. But yeah, that's what the conversation was. It was, you know, Mrs. Seller, let's, let's call it that Mrs. Seller. Uh, we're going to buy your property. We're going to give you the price that you're relatively asking for. Right. Mm -hmm. But in, in turn, we're going to ask you to hold financing, which she had the building paid off. So, you know, it was no issue. Uh, we're going to pay you interest um, on this, on this endeavor. And it's going to help you tax wise because if you know someone comes along and gives you the entire purchase price of 575 you're going to be taxed on that entire amount in the year you receive it mm -hmm. however if you let us purchase the building with owner financing and i forget what the numbers are let me just use easy numbers here let's say it's 350 or 370 mm -hmm. uh is what she received in that year for, from the from the bank right for the first yeah. mortgage yeah. so now you're going to receive 370 you're going to be taxed on that amount and whatever's left over you can spread over, I think, up to a max of five years. So you can spread that out and you're going to make interest on that and your headache goes away immediately. So mm -hmm. she, she, was, she was ready to sign the papers, right? Yeah. She was done. So and, and again, that's it. It, it really does yes. help the sellers with their tax, uh, tax burden um, because they get to spread the love is kind of how we say it, right? Yeah, and mm -hmm. you mentioned one thing, Darren, about uh, one point I wanted to make as well. Um, so this one was a six plex. We've done it on smaller. We've done it on bigger units. So the number of units don't matter. Um, it's, it's just a matter of, is it a good fit for the seller? And are you going to get some no's? Absolutely. Even when we bought 12 in 12 months um, and many of them, the majority of them were with owner financing, but we did use different strategies. 
Um, did we get a lot of no's? Absolutely. Did we get a lot of owner financing opportunities that didn't make sense because we didn't have that clear exit strategy? Absolutely. So it's really making sure to be comfortable with getting some no's because it doesn't work for everyone. Um, and also getting ensuring not to get too excited because you, oh, I can get into this deal with no, no money down. Well, that's great, but you have to look out for, your, for the future as well, making sure that you truly have that clear exit strategy. And was there any um, pushback, if you will, for lack of a better term on essentially, you know, you're buying the property at that point. Um, they're a second mortgage holder. So they go from being an owner now to a lender, but they know this property. You're going to go in and you're going to renovate it. Is there any sort of, uh, um, like I say, pushback on what your skills are as renovators and how you're going to turn this building over? What happens if, you know, somebody went in there and destroyed it and then all of a sudden they defaulted, you know, that would be something that as a, as an inexperienced owner, they might ask those kinds of questions. How do you handle that? Yeah. Great question. And we get that all the time. Uh, I love it. So the objections, they, they hit us with them all the time and, and, and rightfully so, right? They're, they're basically going to be the bank. They should be asking us questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in our, well, in our situation, we'll be able to show them past renovations and past experience. Um, but again, it, it's all, everyone's been there their first time, right? I'm thinking back to try and help as many people. The first time that we had that objection, we, we basically just laid out our game plan here. Here's our maintenance team. Here's our contractor. Here's the price that they've given us. So I'm not just, you know, blowing smoke. Uh, we're, we're going to be trying to do X, Y, Z, which we figure will accomplish, uh, this amount of rent, which overall will increase the value of the building. So if you have to take it back. Um, so just showing them the legwork that you have done, if you've not done it before, right? Like you're going to get those quotes and get those prices and, and check out some materials that you're going to put in. Other objections we get, Darren, is I need to talk to my accountant, and my lawyer, and mm. absolutely go talk to your accountant, go talk to your lawyer. And they're going to have an opinion, which again, is fair, right? So their, their lawyer is going to say, you know, what if, what if, what if to the nth degree and, and, and be ready to answer those questions. Yes. If you do take the property back, if for whatever reason we go belly up, uh, I understand, you know, when you have assignment of rents and you have guarantees and, and all this stuff. But after I've told you my plan, after I've laid out what we're going to do with it, you're actually going to be taking back a better building than what you gave it to us. And uh, you'll have a value, a, sorry, a better evaluation there. And the accountants, same thing. They'll say, well, you know, they'll talk about taxes and all that, but in the grand scheme of things, they have to be comfortable, but be ready for those objections because they're coming and the accountants, will, the accountants will ask them. So Yeah, and be ready to, in, in a way, almost sales pitch yourself, right? What are you bringing? What are you offering? If you've done it before then, and you've been successful at it, talk about it. If you haven't done it before, what do you bring to the table? Maybe you have a full-time job right now, you know, they feel secure that you, your income is there. Maybe you have great credit. Maybe you're a very handy person and you're going to do the renovations yourself. So yeah. whatever you have, uh, make sure to, to talk about it as well. Cause it is, I mean, they are in a sense buying into you as well, right? They have to be, feel comfortable. It benefits them of course, but they also have to feel comfortable with you that you will truly take the property from here to here. And I can't stress this enough, the communications piece, and it doesn't have to be consistent, but it has to be there absolutely um, throughout the relationship of, of where the building's at, right? Whether it's sending them a little video or taking pictures or a little email saying, hey, you know, just, just so you know, we want to let you know that we just I don't know, replace the shingles, for example, or whatever it is. It makes them feel good, they, right? They mm -hmm. love it. They love the updates. Sure yeah. You mentioned the renovation and because you use OPM, how did you finance that? Either with our own, pay, our own uh, savings or sometimes we'll do the fund to flip, right? Where we'll say to someone, hey, we need 50K. Uh, here's the, the, the very clear, precise plan. Um, it's gonna be a promissory no contractual agreement and you'll be paid as soon as we refinance and then we'll show them, boom, our cash flow analysis matrix, which, which shows them factual numbers and, and predictions uh, on, on market and, and rents and that type of thing. Exactly, yeah. often depends what the amount or depends what else we have going on. Um, if it's a small amount, then we'll just carry it. If it's a full big, you know, bank repo and we'll, we'll need to be putting lots of money into it, then in that case, uh, we'll, we'll usually do a promissory note with someone. And then obviously when the refinance happens, uh, what's the order that you pay out? Yeah, so the order will be, the, you know, the first and second mortgages, right? Because the lawyers, they kind of take care of all of that. And uh, depending on terms and, and, and lengths, let's say, or um, uh, yeah, terms, what am I, I'm looking for another word there. 
but let's say we had a one year term. We'll ask them, we'll say, Hey, we just refinanced right now. Here are the funds. Do you want to keep, do you want to keep going? Do you want to add it on? And they, they might say, well, we have six months left. Uh, let's wait and, and pay me back then. Cause I want to keep making interest. So it's working with the lender. Some of them yes. will say, okay, let's, let's clear up. Let's uh, let's square up. I mean, sorry. And let's do it again. And let's say we had six months left. Now that you've shown me the ability to repay, let's do a two year term, you know, same, same thing two year term. So it, it it's so important to work yeah. with people. And I will say this little, little pro tip here on the, on the <laughs> side is that if you do decide, so if let's say, okay, it's time to, to pay them back um, and, and they agree to lend you the money right away to do something else with it, actually do pay them back. Like do that, that transfer of funds. Um, mm -hmm. so if you're using somebody's, let's say a uh, promissory note with somebody and it was $100,000 and for one year, for example, okay, you pay them back with interest, um, and they say, no, no, you know, keep my, and this happens to us all the time. Keep the money. I, I want to keep, you know, you're making me money. I'm happy with you guys. I want to just keep investing. We will literally say, no, I want to show you that I have the money. I'm going to pay you back, do that and then bring it back. And I think it truly builds that trust because now it's no longer of, oh, could they really afford to, you know, pay why, you back? Why are they if rolling I, it yeah, over? Why are they yeah. rolling it over? No, we're, let's finish this transaction and start fresh. And again, it just builds that trust with the lenders. Yeah, it's really smart. I like that, that you actually show tangible things that you give them back and then they can re-advance re it if they'd like. But it, is, yeah. it definitely is a, a psychological thing for investors. Money it is. And it we've is. had some lenders that lend us X amount of money and they're like, that's all I'm willing to ever invest. And then we paid them back. And then once we did it, like, well, <laughs> just to let you know, I do have extra money. I didn't want to tell you about it. <laughs> exactly. This happened two months ago. Yeah. Was, uh, let's say Mrs. Investor. Yeah. She had lent us 30 or 40K for a fund to flip type thing. And... Um, we had the money and she said, you want to do it again? And I said, yeah, but let, let's pay you back. And she said, no, no, I trust you. And I said, no, no, let's do the 30,000 plus the interest owed to you. Let me put it back in your bank account and then let's have a conversation if you want to do it again. And the exact same thing. We, we get on the phone, we get on Zoom two weeks later. By the way, Dave, I have another hundred. So she ends up lending us 140 yeah. because now that trust has been built. And, yeah. and, and another, another guy we met with at the restaurant a couple of weeks ago, same thing. It was $100,000. We paid him back. Weeks later, we meet again. He gave us the same hundred, but now the terms are better. Now the interest lowers because the mm -hmm. trust is there. Now the, the reporting requirements, all that stuff changes. So just building that rapport is, is priceless. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Let's, uh, I want to, I want to ask you guys about this because I've seen you talk about it many times and I've never got the full story. Um, tell me about this car accident that you had and how it, how it changed everything that you do and, and the outlook you have on your life. Yeah, it was, it was a life changing day for so many reasons um we were on our way actually to a real estate investing conference and dave and i were in the back of the vehicle working away on our on our laptops and our our suv got uh hit by a car that got hit before that by a careless transport driver we hit the guardrail and literally rolled uh four times across the highway we landed upside down um you may have seen the picture the vehicle was completely crushed and we, we barely survived. And thankfully, the three kids weren't with us. Um, mm. So it was just Dave and I. And it was a life-changing day for so, so many reasons. I, me I remember we uh, took us by ambulance, of course, to the hospital. And I remember sitting there. And I was actually thinking about work even. I don't know why, but it kept coming to my mind thinking, oh, gosh, I don't want to have to worry about ever traveling for work or doing anything like that. And it made me realize I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be working for somebody else. Um, and of course, you know, we're thinking about the kids and all that stuff that weekend or the same day, actually, we were released. We still ended up going to the real estate investing conference. <laughs> and before then we were so secretive on how we bought these properties. Like, how did we buy all these properties where people used to ask us and we were very secretive. And then we thought to ourselves, why are we not helping other people achieve financial freedom through real estate? Um, you know, why are we being so secretive? So it was a completely a, a complete shift in how we, we used to think. We decided to write a book that weekend. Um, afterwards, I was off on a, with a severe concussion for a while. And again, thinking about work and, and I decided to quit my full-time job. So I never went back after my accident. Um, and the only reason I was able to do that was because we already had a real estate portfolio. So it yeah. truly gave me the freedom to do what I want. I wanted to see my little kid get on and off the school bus. Um, and that's what we do now is that we help other real estate investors who want to buy multifamily without their own money create the same thing. 
So I didn't leave much for you to say. Today. <laughs> you pretty much nailed it. Anything <laughs> else to, no. to add, Dave? It's such a phenomenal story. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us um, have probably had those moments on a much smaller scale, right? Where we just realize whatever we're doing right now is not necessarily what we want to do. And what do we, what do we have to do to make that switch to become full-time real estate investors and to create that financial freedom that we truly desire. So um, I, I, I love your story. I love everything you guys are doing. Um, I'm going to leave a link in the description below because you guys are on, on Instagram and on Facebook and you've got your YouTube channel and you've got your website and you've got your, your trainings and everything that you're doing. Uh, so I'm going to make sure we, we leave that uh, information for everybody below. Um, I, I just want to kind of close out with asking you guys to give us a bit of advice uh, for folks that are looking to do similar things to what you're doing. Um, you know, how do they get started? Um, obviously with the, probably the biggest thing is going to be education and training, but beyond that, what's, what's a sort of a first step in, in going along this path of using OPM, owning things outright? Yeah, absolutely. I'll start and then you can, or do you want to start Dave so I don't take over again? No, I, <laughs> mine's going to be short and sweet. So. Okay. I tend to <laughs> talk a little more sometimes. Um, honestly, I would say yes, of course, education, all that. So, so you can do it right. Uh, but don't stop yourself and don't use excuses. You know, even when I started, I was a single mom living in a two bedroom apartment and thinking like, how am I ever going to get out of this mess? And, and, and it's doable. And the reality is everybody is limitless. Everybody can do it. You just have to get that knowledge and take action. So if you're scared, you know, take action. If you're scared, get educated and, and just keep moving and making progression every single day. If you're working full time, you don't have time, you know, that, that half an hour or an hour consistently does add up to a lot. Mm. And then mine, yeah, a lot shorter, a lot sweeter. It's just <laughs> <laughs> because it's something that, that, that affected me in the beginning was the naysayers, that, that upset stomach of, should I be listening to them? Are they right? Putting all those terrible thoughts in your head and then having that breakthrough of, why am I listening to someone who hasn't done what I want to do, who, doesn't, who hasn't accomplished something? So just don't listen to naysayers. Listen to people that are more successful than you because they're going to tell you, hey, it's doable and go for whatever you want in life. I love it. Thank you guys so much for taking some truly valuable time out of your day. I really do appreciate that. I know that the audience uh, will appreciate this interview for sure. You guys dropped so much gold. If you guys enjoyed the session today with Mel and Dave, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel and uh, feel free to leave comments and questions below for us. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say, Mel, Dave, thank you so much for joining me. I wish you guys the best of success on your real estate investing journey, and hopefully our paths will cross at some point soon, and we'll, we'll maybe one day be in the same room again like we met years ago back in North Bay, <laughs> and I just look forward to following you guys on your journey, and I, and I, I know you guys are going to do some amazing things in the next, uh, in the next little while. Thanks awesome. so much. Thank and you so you're much, wonderful as well. Uh, we always love uh, watching your content as well. So thank Absolutely. you so much and keep crushing it as well. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful day. You, you too. too. Thanks. Bye.